Here's my bold prediction. I think there's a very good chance that we are sitting now on another inflection point. And I say that because AI is a technology that has become easy to implement, a critical factor as I identified before, and B, is on Moore's law. Moore's law means that it can do twice as much for you roughly every two years. Or another way to put it is, you can do the same as what you did at half the cost every two years. Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Joining me today on this episode of the Active Advisor Podcast, we are thrilled to welcome a seasoned expert, David Mara, co-founder and head of portfolio management at Markin Asset Management. David is a specialist in systematic multi-asset strategies. With an MBA from the University of Chicago and a background as a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, where he advised top executives in the asset management industry, David has a unique understanding of how investment management can be a secret weapon for transforming REAs and driving their business growth to new heights. Join us as we discuss the power of creating exceptional investment experiences and explore how the repeatability of your investment processes can not only attract and retain investors, but also drive significant growth for RAAs and multifamily offices. Welcome, David, and thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. It's, I'm delighted to be with you, Brian. You've got quite the background. I must compliment you on it. I'm sure you get a lot of questions and quite the unique experiences I'm sure you've learned over the years. However, we're going to focus on you right now. So one of the things we like to do when we begin this podcast is we really love to hear What's your first memory you have related to money or investing? What comes to mind, it's probably not my first memory because it's actually post business school, but it's my most vivid memory is raising venture capital money and starting an internet search engine business. And this was in back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was raising the money in the late 90s, actually. And it was a nine month process to come up with the idea put the business plan together, put a team together, because I put a big portion of the team together beforehand, the technology team, et cetera, together, the management team, and then, you know, shop it around to VCs and ultimately got our first round on, I think, December 23rd of that year. It started in March or April of that year, doing all those activities and then negotiating the agreement and actually signed it, I think, on the 23rd of December. And that's why it sticks in my mind, because it was the best Christmas present I'd ever gotten up till then. Yeah. Well, there you go. I've got to ask, what kind of key things did you learn from that early business plan? If it was straight out of business school, I'm sure you've learned the textbooks and the lessons that you were taught. It was a great business school. What kind of surprised you, I guess, during that whole raising venture capital process? I think probably one thing, I was young and had a lot of energy, but what surprised me was the ridiculous amount of energy, commitment, passion you have to bring to it because you have no resources, right? The only resource you have is your ideas and your leadership, your passion for something unproven. At this time, search engines were a brand new thing. It was the Wild West. Google hadn't even incorporated yet. We incorporated, I think, two months before Google did, something like that. You have to go back to a period in time when nothing was proven, nobody knew what was going to happen, who knew what was going to be the big thing for the internet. And so you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty and you're having to prove to people who are putting real money in their millions of dollars that you had the team to be able to do the execution and to build it. You just throw your entire life into it. And I think the degree to which you submerge <laughs> and you don't come up for air until you move on from the venture, that was probably the biggest aspect of it for me. Just listening to you, I want to basically take a guess here and say that you learned the time value of money, it sounds like, better than anybody. I would love to hear a little bit more about your background and the journey that led you to mark and asset management. Yes, you know, so I'd come out of business school. I had done a few years of management consulting, and then I did the venture we just talked about. And that venture for me the, in the search engine business, I was not really a technologist before then. I had been a computer programmer in high school and college. I was an engineer and and did economics. And so I'd done computer programming all for many years. 
But that was my first experience to really experience the power of technology, and in particular, compute-based technology, because it's all algorithms, it's all data, it's all compute. And I just got the bug. It was a once-bitten kind of thing. And that got me thinking, after that venture, I got thinking, how could I combine this emerging era of more data availability, of cheaper compute, more sophisticated algorithms with what I'd been trained in as an MBA, which was in finance. And so got thinking about how I could combine Stanford being the statistical AI type of leader with Chicago, right? Chicago being the fundamental investment kind of mindset. How could you combine these two to be able to manage portfolios toward outcomes in a better way? That's what I got thinking about after that venture. And I actually ended up doing six years of research. Just, I went back to management consulting and I was on the side, I was doing this research, right? And I'm actually interacting with academics all over the world. I'm reading a few hundred journal articles a year just to come up to speed on the state of quantitative finance to figure out what is it that, that I could add? What kind of technology could we create that would add to the state of quantitative finance, quantitative investing in particular, and then I founded a investment research firm here in, in Rye, New York in 2010 to build a compute and data-based infrastructure and then sell a quantitative-based research to other those institutionally oriented institutional managers. And then a few years ago, we started at that firm to create our own investment strategies, not just creating for other people, but to create our own investment strategies. And then three years ago, my partner, Matt Kinzer, and I formed Markin to bring those strategies and now new strategies as well based on that kind of quantitative infrastructure to advisors and to advisor clients. That's great. And I'm sure it's been an interesting journey along the way. But I love kind of hearing you out of business school, you formed kind of an internet search engine. You took six years off to do a lot of research into the quantitative space. So I've got to ask, basically, you definitely have built yourself up as one of the probably the leading people, the forethinkers of AI. But if I can take you there for a second, I think that's something that definitely late 2023, mid 2023 kind of caught the investing world by storm. Would love to hear your thoughts about AI as an investment strategy and what kind of do you think is going to lend itself to kind of longevity in the space? My perspective on AI is, and I've seen it from two perspectives, really, right? One is as a user programmer of AI and machine learning based systems, right? So from that kind of research and technology building perspective. And then I've seen it from the perspective of a theme for investing. And for investing, I've seen it from the inside out, actually, because in management consulting, at different points, a lot of what we were doing was trying to take, trying to build up big data sets within companies and then use algorithms to try to drive some business outcome, right? And that's what I was, and I can tell you, you go back not even that long ago, just go back five years ago, even three years ago, and I've seen it over a much longer period of time, but just relatively short period of time, it was very difficult to implement these data and algorithmic-based systems into a business and actually get an ROI, right? Because you had so many problems. You had problems with building up the data sets. You had to build these bespoke models. You needed a lot of specialized people. And then you need all kinds of specialized technology infrastructure. Fast forward to today, and these generative AI is so much more easy to implement in a business in a way that's going to drive earnings per share, that's going to drive margin, that's going to drive growth. And the reason why is foundational models, right? Foundational models are what the big firms are building, and they create a foundation model is a simple way of saying it just creates a more generalizable platform from which then you can just add your data on top. You don't have to build the whole platform. It's built for you. You just add your marketing data on top or your user data on top or your competitor data on top, whatever data you've got. And all of a sudden, or if you've got chat data, you can add that on top and you can specialize something that's already built. This is a game changer for firms because it means that in a very short period of time with much less capital investment, they can go from, yeah, I want to start using this stuff to productivity gains. So what we've done, and it was really, I have to thank are the advisors that we work with because they were coming to us saying, we missed the first wave of artificial intelligence investing. You mentioned it earlier, Brian, the NVIDIAs of the world, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. 
we miss that wave. And our clients want to get in, but they're worried they're getting in at too high of a price point if they buy those firms that have just gone up in value. And is there an investment strategy that you can provide us with, which will give us a better entry point? Just in the last two months, well, probably three months, at the end of October, we introduced a new investment strategy called Mark and an Earnings Boost, which is just about diving into, in part, how generative AI is going to affect certain firms, because it's not going to affect all firms equally, because it's not applicable to all tasks at all firms. It has more impact on certain tasks than other tasks. To identify those 50 or so firms that are really going to get the earnings boost from generative AI and similar technologies. So that's one way, in a demonstrable way, we're trying to help advisors to catch the what we call the next wave of artificial intelligence beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are the companies that are using AI to drive, again, that earnings per share. Where, in your opinion, do you think we're at in the AI, I don't want to say revolution, but the AI, I guess, adoption process and, and how it's going to help transform not only the financial world, but where we're at and what we do on a daily basis. So let me go out a little bit on the edge and make a bold prediction that I think in a few years' time won't be considered bold at all, but might be considered bold today. I recently wrote a blog post on this, and it was based on some Niebuhr economists, Niebuhr National Bureau of Economic Research economists. So let me just summarize the story as I see it. But if you look at a chart of global growth, right? Because ultimately equities come down to some form of growth, right? It's growth that translates into earnings, right? And then we get higher prices on assets. If you look at global growth, and economists can take global growth back, estimated back to about the year 1500. If you go back to 1500 and you go up to about just roughly 1847, which is when economists mark what they call the second industrial revolution. There's a mini pre-industrial revolution about 30 years earlier, and then 1847 is when the real start of the Industrial Revolution is where they mark it. If you go from 1500 to 1847, global growth rates are basically a pancake. It's just flat. Not much, a little bit, it's positive, but it's very, very flat. Then you start the Industrial Revolution, and it's literally your hockey stick, right? Global growth rates just shoot up and have continued to shoot up through the present. So the Industrial Revolution was a set of technologies which completely changed the trajectory of global growth. Now, here's my bold prediction. I think there's a very good chance that we are sitting now on another inflection point. And I say that because AI is a technology that has become easy to implement, a critical factor as I identified before, and B, is on Moore's law. Moore's law means that it can do twice as much for you roughly every two years. Or another way to put it is, you can do the same as what you did at half the cost every two years. Some combination of those two, right? So I think we're at another inflection point, potentially, because again, looking at what economists say, there's definitely the potential for it to be as big as the Industrial Revolution. And it will take decades and decades for this to play out. From an investment perspective, when you look, and there are analogies to the Industrial Revolution and other tech revolutions like the dot-com that I was involved with, but if you were at the early end of this, at the early point of this, this is when there's a lot of leverage for companies who kind of get religion faster, right? Who are able to implement the technology better and more quickly and, and there can be a lot of leverage in investing those companies, and those are the companies we're looking for. I love the prediction. I'm in agreement with you. But we're going to have to scale this back now because I'm sure you and I could talk for hours more on kind of the impending growth boom that we're about to have. Would love to hear, get your thoughts on what are some of the ways RAAs and it can use AI presently as a tool to help build or market their practice. I think where we've talked about we're on the impending boom and, and how it's going to help become more ubiquitous. Would love to hear what you see as, I guess, as some low-hanging fruit for RAs. I think RAs usually, let's start with what their objectives are, right? Typically an RIA, its objective is they want to offer better customer service. They want to stay closer to their customers. They want to read things like outcomes that they're looking for are things like reducing turnover in their customers, right? They want to attract more customers of higher value. They want to differentiate themselves in a durable way from their competitors. 
I think the, the other one is they, this kind of advisor time alignment, which gets a lot of talk in the in- industry, right? You spend a lot of time doing things that really don't drive really much value for your practice or for your firm or for yourself, right? There's a lot of busy work because it's a complicated business, right? We have so many technology partners we interface with, broker dealers, et cetera. It's just a very complicated ecosystem. So those are the outcomes I think people are looking for, right? How AI can help is there are now more and more companies out there that use AI technologies to do similar things that we need to do before. For example, back office operations, right? Simplifying back office operations, giving us more connectors to more potential partners in a very robust way that doesn't require a lot of setup time. Think about all those back office functions that if you could have an intelligent way to connect these disparate pieces and maintain these disparate pieces, even just maintaining a linkage to a bank sometimes is problematic for a lot of advisors. All of those back office functions, there are now more and more startups in the AI space using generative AI to reduce the hassles that advisors would do, which is going to manifest in their business in terms of help them keep their eye on the ball and be more customer-oriented, more product-oriented, more differentiation-oriented. Another area is compliance, like automated compliance is a huge area. Algorithms that can, again, just look over your business, so to speak, and proactively identify any compliance issues, but in a much smarter, more intelligent way than it's been done to date. Another thing that I'm seeing is big impacts on the sales and marketing side. We know the sales and marketing challenge. You want to find more customers of higher value, of the type that sort of align with your way of investing. And generative AI is, and I'm sure many there are many advisors out there using it to help them make more marketing materials that have a higher degree of personalization. Because you can feed, again, your customer types data into what you have, and you can get more personalized marketing systems. And then, of course, the last one I'll touch on here is chatbots. So the big investment management firms are investing heavily in chatbots because chatbots are things that can answer customer queries. Now, you may not use the AI to actually answer it, although it's capable of, you know, a lot of people don't want to listen to an AI. I don't want to listen to the AI. But often the chatbot is used internally so that when customers call up, the chatbot is trained on that firm's data that firm's investment philosophy and can give better answers to customer questions from that firm's perspective. So what you get is not only do you get more productivity on customer service, but you get less variation, right? You get higher consistency in making sure that everybody's giving on the same page and giving the best answer that the firm has to offer. Those are just a few areas I'm seeing. It's going to spread even more from there. But these are a few areas that I'm seeing. It definitely sounds like in those areas, those are areas I would say close to core, but definitely very close to home book satellite area and what an RAA or an advisor has to think about. And I say close to home and satellite because I would think that the original one or the core is really client experience, servicing your clients and really servicing them and and making sure that not only are you attracting the right clients, but you're servicing them to the very best. And you mentioned previously that you strive to provide a more sophisticated client experience and how important that is. Can you elaborate on what that looks like? For us, because we're really an asset manager in the ecosystem, and therefore we're a sub-advisor to other wealth managers, either as an OCIO or through our investment advice that manifests through the different strategies we offer. Our perspective in terms of the day in, day out of what we provide is helping advisors to offer a more sophisticated investment management advice and a more sophisticated investment management experience. And in our case, It's primarily focused on three outcomes, better compounding of wealth for people who are pre-retirement, better management of risks so we can deliver more income and more yield for people who are near or in retirement. And then the third one is for taxable accounts, greater tax efficiency. On our side, we're actually users of machine learning and artificial intelligence type systems And we have huge systems in that area. And we use those systems to manage portfolios in a way that deliver those outcomes. Gotcha. Are you applying this kind of, or would you recommend an advisor or a apply this kind of across the board for all their clients? Or would you recommend tiering at all for certain clients? And if you're looking at, you mentioned the three different buckets of clients, earners who are looking, looking to achieve more compounding the taxable accounts. Is there any differentiation there that you're looking that you strive to achieve or really what strategies have you seen improve or benefit each of those different groups? 
we spend a lot of effort in our resource systems to identify and better quantify risks in a portfolio. That's what I do as a portfolio manager. That's what I spend my time in, is trying to improve our system to have a more nuanced and better contextual understanding of what the risks are that our portfolios are taking and then what risks they should take given the mandate that the portfolio has. It's actually a very good question because I think it it so often get missed in the industry. There's a lot of talk about performance, but performance is the outcome of the risks you choose to take. And so and we're, and we're an active an active manager. So we're constantly looking at how the market is evolving, where we are at in the business cycle and all the data underneath to try to really understand what are the risks we're taking, which ones do we want to dial back, which ones do we want to dial up given the different mandates for those different outcomes that I mentioned. That's the guts of what we do as a firm and we try to do that in as disciplined and scientifically rigorous way as possible. That's a great answer. That's really what I was looking at. You definitely, there's three different silos that you mentioned, but within those silos, there's a lot of different stratospheres between each one of those. And I think it's interesting, not only are you using machine learning, but also how you're really looking to get micro focused on each one of those different areas. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, it's not just the machine learning. It's what I call Chicago, or you can call it Adam Smith if you want. We never want to ignore that huge, vast, empirical library of work that's been done by economists and financial economists over decades, right? There are things that have been learned from that that even machines still can't learn, right? You need to have the theory and the empirical work meet kind of the statistical approach. And that's what we try to do. We try to merge it so that it's not a black box, so that there are you can look at something and understand the fundamental risks and the fundamental economic drivers of why something is going to perform the way you want in a certain part of the business cycle. That's a great example. I think AI is definitely advanced and growing, but I think you do need to marry the lifetime of research of several individuals and the economists with that as well. Yeah, the standing on the shoulders of giants type of approach. Yeah. hundred percent. Would love to hear an example that you may have from working with RAs and how you've seen advisors use a lot of the research and strategies that you've done to attract the right clients for them. We have an advisor, an advisor that comes to mind here that on the West Coast has a lot of tech investors, a lot of what I would call higher net worth investors, kind of executives or other people working in the tech industry, high incomes. And this advisor's situation is like a lot of advisors we see, right? They start out with client accounts that are maybe in the $500,000, $750,000 range. And then as they get bigger, on um, this advisor's $100, $150 million kind of range, they want to grow with, and they really need to grow if you want to stay within your geographic area. You need to start to grow with larger clients. And when they came to us, they were right at the point where they wanted to move from that level of investable assets up to the kind of three to $5 million range of investable assets. And it was to help them do that, that the advisor engaged us, right? And they engaged us because we had a more sophisticated investment story. And we had multiple ones of these stories that could help them on the investment management side of their business. And then the other thing was, and vis-a-vis the kind of OCIO kind of services that we offer, which are more service oriented, right? Helping them with cash management and these other functions that we could do in a slightly more scalable way. They were able to offload a lot of the daily grind work that they were doing. They were able to keep the same number of people they had, but they have redeployed them toward more asset gathering and customer service. And that's been very, very successful. We've been working with that advisor now for virtually the whole three years that we've been around. And there are other smaller stories like that with other advisors, but that advisor was comes to mind because it's all about that time value alignment. They didn't want to fiddle around with portfolios anymore. They didn't really think they were adding much value there anyway. They were wanted a specialist to come in and help them build those portfolios and manage them, deal with cash management and other operational issues. And boy, they just run with that. And they're like doing so much more marketing than they were doing three years ago. And that's a great story that dovetails nicely into my next question. I think you've provided extremely solid kind of practices throughout the conversation that we've had. I would love to hear what are some common mistakes or missteps? Because obviously these can be the things that people learn from the most. You get the most bang for your unfortunate mishap that you see RAs making. And are there any easy solutions or recommendations you'd make to do something differently? I think one of the overlooked, I don't know if it's a mistake, but it's definitely an overlooked area for a lot of RIAs is 
take some time out and do two things. One, start logging what your people do all day for a couple of weeks. What are people actually spending their time on? I used to do these time studies in management consulting. You can do them kind of almost electronically now, but it's as simple as keeping a logbook. In a small firm, a dozen people or less, you can just keep a logbook. Just do it for a few weeks. What are people actually spending their time on? Usually when people do that, they're shocked what they find and not usually in a good way. So it's overlooked. You're overlooking that people spend so much time on busy work that just doesn't seem to add value. So find out what that busy work is. And look, the good thing about this industry is there are lots of specialists in this industry. There's a specialist for every single activity and function in this industry. In fact, no asset management business can survive or wealth management business can survive unless you become a specialist in something, right? And then you figure out who are the best partners in it, right? It's all part of the specialization wave, which has been going on now really since the start of the Industrial Revolution. We get more and more specialized, right? In specialization, then you need to do the second thing that I talked about, right? So first is figure out where the dead weight is in your business, right? The things you really aren't adding much value and you're spending way too much time on and then do something about that. The second thing is now with that time you freed up that you're gonna free up, figure out where you are really good. What is the thing that you are really good at that your competitors around the corner, so to speak, can't do as well as you do? And usually this requires some deep thought. Right? It's not just two weeks of a, a little study. This usually requires the practice leaders to get together multiple times and really work it through and kind of work the problem. But figure out that thing that you really think you do really well. And then try to get your business to focus as much as possible. You won't be able to get 100%, but as much as possible, do that thing. And it might be one or two things, but it's not 10 things. It's not eight things. It's not six things. It's one or two things that you do better than everybody else. And you want to build on that in a way that's going to attract more and more customers because you do that so much better than everybody else. Those are two practical steps you can do that will start you on a path toward then putting in the different partners. And again, we're a partner on the investment services side, investment management services side, but putting in the partners in place that can drive your business forward. That's really sound advice. I think we've heard that over our course of conversations on the podcast, that it's really find what you enjoy doing or what I guess drew you to this business and still keeps your attention and just find a way to do that as much as possible because you tend to do, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, you tend to do something that you love to do better than most. I would frame it a little bit differently. This is interesting you mentioned because it came up this past summer when people are graduating college and you, you give your advice to college students, that kind of thing. I never say to college students, do what you love. Why? Because there are so many things we all love. There's no one thing we love. In the work world, we have to focus. I think better advice, not that you want to do something you hate, but I think better advice than do something you love is do something you're really good at because usually something you're good at, you love. So. I would say first, don't focus on what you're good at because you may focus on something you're good at, but you're not really better at than anybody else or nobody cares that you're good at it. Focus on what you're better at. You'll end up loving whatever you create off of that. I guarantee it. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. And I stand corrected. I do like your approach on how to look at that. It is, I think it's 2.0, shall I say. I'm a curious person. All these books behind me, they're on tons of topics, right? And I think most people are that way. I think most people see themselves as being able to do lots of different things at different points in their life, right? And, you know, the road not taken. And there are many roads not taken. But we do, unfortunately or fortunately, we do live in an era that rewards specialization. But you'll find the specialization that's most rewarding if you find that thing that you do better than everybody else. And just to end this segment, I remember the very first day of business school. And the dean, it was Dean Hamada at Chicago with the business school. And he said it was the very first day. We all gathered, the new students, we all gathered. And he said, I want you to take these two years and I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to examine yourself with your clothes off in all honesty and find out what you're really good at. And use these two years to explore and determine what you're really good at. I thought that was fantastic advice and I've used that advice throughout my career. Excellent. Well said. David, I'd like to thank you so much for candidly sharing your experiences and wisdom with us today. I know I've learned a lot as for our listeners. Thanks so much for having me on. It was delightful to speak with you. In closing, I have got to ask one last question of you. 
From your experience, where have you observed active management making the most significant difference? There are many points, but the single biggest point is reducing exposure to large losses. Reducing exposure to large losses helps you compound wealth better. So it helps you in the pre-retirement area. And reducing exposure to large losses helps you improve your income and your yield in retirement. That's the biggest thing. That's actually the thing we focus on. I go back to my risk discussion. That's the thing we focus on because it's, it has so much leverage in terms of outcomes. Well said. What's the best way for people to find you? They can find me on LinkedIn, David Mara, M-A-R-R-A. Put in Mark and Asset Management, David Mara. I'm sure I'll come right up. Or of course, you can go to our website. There's lots of ways to reach out to us on the website. And that's markinfunds.com, M-A-R-K-I-N-F-U-N-D-S.com. Well, thank you so much today. And we're going to move on. We're going to keep you a little bit longer. We're going to move on to my favorite segment, which I like to call the lightning round. However, it's officially called 60 Seconds with David Mara. Hobby. I love reading and traveling. Profession if you weren't in finance. Probably technology. Hidden talent. Curiosity. Favorite program that you use to code. R. I code in R. Favorite place in Japan. Kyoto. If you could teleport anywhere for five minutes, where would you go? I would teleport myself in summertime to Tanglewood. What's the best professional advice you've ever received? Throughout your career, actively seek and find mentors. Biggest risk you've ever taken? Starting three companies. What never fails to make you laugh? My wife's laugh. What's something you wish you were better at? I wish I were better at being persuasive. I think that's a superpower, if you will, for everybody in any field is not just being logical or right or having good analysis, but being able to persuade people who are skeptical of whatever they're skeptical of. Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, the Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to the Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now for important disclosures. This material is for informational purposes and is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research or investment advice and is not a recommendation, offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of 10th of January 2024 and are subject to change. The opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. to be reliable and are not necessarily all-inclusive and are not guaranteed as to accuracy. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. Such information may include, among other things, projections and forecasts. There is no guarantee that any of these views will come to pass. This material may not be representative of the experience of other individuals. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the viewer. This material is not legal, tax or accounting advice. Please consult with a qualified professional for this type of advice. Using artificial intelligence, AI, involves risks. AI systems relying on complex algorithms and training data may produce inaccurate results, introducing algorithmic uncertainty and potential biases. Lack of human oversight, security vulnerabilities, and the evolving regulatory landscape contribute to operational and legal risks. Ethical considerations, such as societal impact and fairness, further underscore the need for careful evaluation. Users should conduct thorough due diligence, monitor evolving risks, and seek professional advice to navigate the dynamic landscape of AI responsibility. Financial professionals should consult their firm's AI policy and compliance department for firm-specific requirements. Investing involves risk including the risk of loss. 
Stock markets are volatile and equity values can decline significantly in response to adverse issuer, political, regulatory, market and economic conditions. Fixed income investments are affected by interest rate changes and the creditworthiness of issuers. As interest rates rise, the values of fixed income securities are likely to decrease. Specific companies and issuers are mentioned for educational purposes only and should not be deemed a recommendation to buy or sell any securities. Any companies mentioned do not necessarily represent current or future holdings of any investment products. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. This material is prepared by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. is not affiliated with Markin Asset Management. All trademarks or product names mentioned herein are the property of their respective owners. Copyright 2023 Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. All rights reserved.